Now we're going to look at fallacies of weak induction. And as the name weak induction suggests, we're going to be looking at inductive arguments that are not strong arguments, they're weak arguments. That is, the premises, do, they fail to make the conclusion such that it's more likely to be true than not. So it doesn't get us over that 50% mark that, uh, of, of the conclusion probably being true, which is necessary for an argument to be a strong argument. So um, as I have written here, an argument that commits a fallacy of weak induction is defective insofar as the connection between the argument's premises and conclusion is not strong enough to support the conclusion. Um, and just as a nice example of, um, of an argument that is weak, an inductive argument that is weak, we have in this comic this person saying, someday I want to get married because studies show that married people are happier. And then Dilbert tells us that a smarter interpretation is that no one wants to marry an unhappy person. So the original thought was getting married makes you happy, right? It's, it's the act of getting married that ends up causing you to be happy. Whereas Dilbert is saying really the better causal explanation is that unhappy people don't get married, only happy people get married, um, or at least are much more likely to get married. So she says, you're annoying, um, and he points out that with any luck, your soulmate won't be perceptive. Um, so the, the fallacy that's taking place here is what we call false cause. She's, she's uh, misinterpreting the causal, uh, the causal direction um, that happiness and marriedness have with one another. All right, let's take a, a deeper look at these fallacies of weak induction. The first fallacy of weak induction that we're going to look at is appeal to unqualified authority. So we'll, if you'll recall, we had discussed that one of the kinds of inductive arguments available to us is appeal to authority. And the idea behind appeal to authority is that you're appealing to somebody who is an expert in her field. And since her, she's going to be more knowledgeable about her field than we will, um, she's more likely to be correct. And when that person really is an expert or specialist in her field, then um, the appeal to authority is a strong argument. It's a compelling argument. The problem is sometimes our supposed experts aren't actually experts or for some reason lack credibility. So for example, Jim Rogers, CEO of Duke Energy, says that emissions from coal plants have no effect on climate change. He must know what he is talking about since he is in the business of burning coal. Therefore, coal plant emissions don't contribute to climate change. If you're not being critical, you might be fooled into thinking that this is a strong argument. And that's because Jim Rogers, being a CEO of a coal plant, um, is associated or has some expertise about coal. Um, the problem is he doesn't have expertise about the relationship that coal has with the climate because that's the kind of... Um, that's the kind of expertise that a climatologist would have or some other um, scientist. And in fact, the expertise that Jim has, has something to do, being a CEO, has something more to do with business management or making good business decisions with respect to the coal industry. So that's not going to make him an expert about whether burning coal um, does contribute to climate change or not. So that would be an example of, of um, appeal to an unqualified authority. Here we have a much more blatant case of appeal to unqualified authority. Uh, who looks like, this person who looks like um, a prosecutor says, so tell me Mr. Einstein, who do you think is going to win the Super Bowl this year? Now Einstein of course is an expert but his expertise lies in physics, not on sports more generally or on um, 
football more specifically. So um, asking Einstein isn't going to help you determine who is more likely to win the Super Bowl than somebody else. Instead, we need to appeal to some sports experts of some sort. The next fallacy of weak induction that we're going to take a look at is appeal to ignorance. And structurally speaking, this can take two different forms. Someone can point out that uh, a particular thing has not been proven to be true. And since we have failed to prove that it's true, it must not be true. Or it can run in the other direction. A person can point out that something has not been disproved, therefore it must be true. So um, an example, uh, really I should, should have given two examples here. The standard cases of appeal to ignorance, we get um, about the existence of God. So people, you, you probably have heard someone say, well, look, you haven't disproven that. You don't know that. You don't know if that God um, doesn't exist. And therefore, implicitly, they're maintaining, I get to st I'm still justified in believing that he does exist. Right? So he does exist. Uh, you, of course, you can run that the other direction. You probably have also heard uh, no one has proved that God exists. No one's proved the existence of God. Um, therefore, we know he doesn't exist. Or I'm, I get to be justified in maintaining that, um, uh, that he doesn't exist. But in both of those cases, if it's really true that we don't have evidence one way or the other um, that warrants a conclusion one way or the other, the correct position or the correct inference ends up being that we should suspend judgment about it, right, until further evidence either um, makes it more likely to be, one of those positions being more likely to be true than false. Uh, up here in the, the right-hand corner, um, I, I picked a, I found this um, I found this little uh, caption of this guy who was uh, part of pop culture at least for a little while uh, and he was on the history channel which is unfortunate that it's still called the history channel but he was on the history channel and they would look at various uh, apparent uh, mysteries involving sort of historical events like maybe how the pyramids were built or things of that sort and this guy would come on and he would say well look we don't know how this took place therefore aliens it must have been aliens that did it and <clears throat> this is actually a helpful strategy or illustrates a helpful strategy to um, help you test out whether appeal to ignorance is taking place Notice how ridiculous it sounds if we say no one has disproved the existence of aliens, therefore we know aliens exist. Or you can substitute uh, unicorns or leprechauns in for that. So no one has disproved the existence of unicorns, therefore we know unicorns exist. No one gets fooled on, about that, although we do get fooled um, in other when we talk about other things besides unicorns or aliens. Um, before moving on to the next fallacy, it's important to point out that there are cases that sometimes look like appeal to ignorance, but um, aren't. And that takes place when systematic research has been done to um, try to prove something to be true and fails. So if you have systematic good methodological um, and, and you're persistent in trying to find out whether a particular claim is true and you come up empty-handed, that is evidence that the thing in question is false. So uh, as an example, um, Descartes had hypothesized that space was filled with a plenium, so it was this uh, substance, if you will, that actually is filling up space. And this was to help explain why there was this association between the moon and um, the tides, how the tides worked in the sea. The moon, when it came into orbit or whatever, or came closer, or I don't know how, the exact 
I guess it probably works from day to night. Um, the idea was that the moon was pushing on this plenium, which then came down and pushed on the, the sea and made for higher tides, bigger tides. And so scientists, you know, this was a, a live hypothesis and scientists tried to find this plenium um, with, you know, systematic research and then just couldn't find it even after trying really, really hard and using sophisticated methods. And in that case, it is um, okay to say, uh, right, it's, it really is likely that plenium doesn't exist in this case. But if you haven't done that systematic type of research or investigation, then you're going to end up appealing to ignorance and committing that fallacy. Next, we have hasty generalization. So one of the uh, styles of inductive argumentation we saw is generalization, where um, what takes place is you take a sample of a population, you investigate that sample, see that um, each of the, the um, members of that sample end up having a particular property, and then you generalize out, maintaining that the whole population um, also has those properties, that each member of the whole population has those properties. So a hasty generalization occurs when there's a good chance that the sample that you've used is not representative of the whole population of the group. And that can happen um, in a number of ways. So in uh, here I have this example. Bill, um, Bill says, man, two cars with Missouri license plates cut me off on my way here. Roy, Missourians, not only bad at basketball, but they suck at driving too. And this is a hasty generalization that Roy is making because all we have is two cars with Missouri license plates. And it's a very small sample size to be maintaining that all drivers um, in Missouri are bad at driving. Other ways in which our sample uh, can be not re representative is if we don't have a random sample. If we have some sort of systematic way of picking out who's going to belong to our sample, then we could accidentally be selecting um, for the, the property in question that we end up um, generalizing out to the population. And if we are, for whatever reason, accidentally selecting for that property, well, it's just not going to be the case that um, everybody in the total population is going to have that property. We just had a bad way of, of deciding who was going to get in our sample to begin with. So that's a couple of ways in which hasty generalization um, can be committed. And here we have a, another case of hasty generalization. My dad smoked all his life and hasn't gotten cancer. I don't think smoking can be that bad for you. Well, you have one case. You have one case of one person who didn't get cancer. Um, so you're now going to generalize that to all people who are smoking that that really doesn't have negative effects. The problem is when we take a larger sample size, we see that um, a very high percentage of people who smoke uh, are going to get lung cancer. And therefore, we can generalize that percentage out to the whole entire population. And we see you can see hasty generalization take place also with people who maintain that um, you know, they know somebody who would have died if they didn't have, if, if they would have been wearing their seatbelt. Um, therefore, they don't wear their seatbelt. Well, that's a problem because if you look at the statistics, um, seatbelts on, on average save people's lives way more than not wearing a seatbelt saves your lives. So the, the risk that you're taking is a poor one. Um, even though you know somebody who would have died if they had their seatbelt on. The fallacy that we're looking at next is false cause. 
And if we recall, one of the styles of inductive argumentation available to us is causal inferences. So if we're aware that there's causal, there's cause and effect relationships between events, we can use that to infer what's going to happen in the future, or we can infer what has happened. So the example I had used involved an electrical storm passing over a forest and then there being a forest fire. Well, since we know that there's a causal relationship between electrical storms and lightning strikes, and we know that there's a causal relationship between light, lightning striking trees and trees catching on fire, then we can use that knowledge to infer that it was probably what caused the forest fire was probably lightning striking a tree. The fallacy occurs when the supposed causal connection that's being relied on in making the inference just probably doesn't exist. And this is how many of our superstitions um, come about. So here we have this example. Every time I've washed my shirt before the game, we end up losing. I guess I probably shouldn't wash it anymore before the game. So the idea here is that um, washing your shirt has some sort of causal connect, causal, or is causing your team to lose. And that's probably just not the case. Here's just probably a coincidence and we're making the wrong inference. And then over here on the right, I have this um, family circus uh, cartoon where we have the, the boys saying, I wish they didn't turn on that seatbelt sign so much. Every time they do, it gets bumpy. So he's wrong, wrongly inferring that the turning on the sign causes the bumpiness when in fact the causal, the causal direction is running the other way. Uh, whenever it's about to get bumpy, they turn on the, uh, they turn on the um, seatbelt sign. The next fallacy we're looking at is slippery slope. And a slippery slope takes place when we're told that one event will set off this chain reaction that'll eventually get us to an event that we really don't like, that we really don't want to happen. So again, we have the idea is you have some event, maybe event A, right? That's gonna cause some other event, which is gonna have, gonna lead to yet another one, and so on and so on until um, it eventually leads to some other one, right? And the idea is you really don't want Y to happen whatever Y ends up being. Y would be a bad thing. And since A is eventually gonna get us to Y, we better be against A as well. We better not want it. So the fallacy takes place when it's improbable that A really is gonna get you to Y. And of course, it's gonna be more and more improbable the more and more that, the, the longer and longer that chain reaction is supposed to be. Like it's more and more improbable that you really are going to have this catastrophic event that we want to prevent. Um, and slippery slopes are successful in, in um, tricking us to accept somebody's conclusion because of the fear that we have about this last event. Um, you know, it masks that improbability of the first event really getting us to this terrible event. So here, our first event is that we legalize marijuana. And this says, if we legalize marijuana, then kids are going to start smoking it. If kids smoke marijuana, then they won't graduate and go on to college. If kids don't go on to college, then we will not have engineers, doctors, business people, psychologists, etc. Right, that's going to lead to our buildings, health, and economy to crumble. The American society will decay into some nightmarish dystopian landscape. Clearly, we cannot legalize marijuana. Of course, we don't want a nightmarish dystopian landscape to happen. And since legalizing marijuana is going to lead to that, according to this person, we shouldn't 
legalize marijuana. Of course, it's, it's very unlikely that even if we legalize marijuana and even if um, many kids smoke marijuana, that it's going to prevent a wide swath of our population from graduating and going on to college. <clears throat> so um, it's very improbable that if we legalize it, it's going to, uh, you know, it's going to eventually lead to this nightmarish dystopian landscape that we don't want. And that's why this is fallacious. Here we have an example of slippery slope. So we have one guy saying to the other, your recycling could be a serious threat to our beloved seagulls nesting grounds, the town dump. And think about this, no seagulls equal fewer car washes, fewer car washes equal fewer jobs, and fewer jobs equal more crime. Your recycling program will condemn our fair town to chaos. Citizens will flee in panic, roads will fall into disrepair, fires will rage rem remorselessly. And then the guy says, the good news is if there are zombies, you'll be safe. Right, and pointing out, um, taking taking the conclusion even further to zombies, just to point out how ridiculous this line of reasoning is. That re this chain of reaction is going to really happen. I should say that um, now that I've pointed out slippery slope, you'll notice people use it incorrectly, uh, use that term incorrectly regularly. So people will say. Uh, slippery slope when they mean that the chain reaction will actually get you to this horrible conclusion. Um, <clears throat> but that's not accurate. Really, it's a fallacy. In fact, when somebody says that it's a slippery slope, that is a signal to you to be very attentive to whether you think the conclusion that they're reaching, the chain reaction that they're positing, really is probable or whether it's improbable. We're now going to look at weak analogies, and a weak analogy occurs when um, it's not sufficient. The analogy provided isn't sufficient for pushing the conclusion over that 50% mark, making it more probable at being true than being false. And there's a number of reasons why this might take place. It could be that we are appealing to too few similarities between the things that we're comparing. It could be that we're not comparing enough things. We don't have an, um, enough instances of these similarities showing that they are relevant. Or it could be pretty clear that the similarities that we're appealing to are irrelevant to um, the conclusion that we're wanting to draw, the extra property that we want to suggest would obtain. And it's that latter case that's occurring here in this example. So we have astronomy and astrology. We find out that both have long histories. Uh, we find out that several books have been written on both topics. And we find out that they both study the stars. The conclusion then we make is, beca is because the fact that astronomy tends to be accurate in their predictions, then we can know or infer that the same is going to be true with astrologers. Our problem here is that long histories, having several books written on both topics, and the fact that both study stars, isn't relevant to whether um, astrology, whether a field that, that has all those things in common, makes good predictions, whether their predictions are accurate. The reason why the predictions for astronomers are accurate it has to do with their reliance on the mathematical models of physics um, and their observation. And we don't appeal to anything like that with respect to astrologers. So we're going to be making a, a bad inference then. Here's a nice visualization of a weak comparison. Um, the two objects are both named mouse but outside of that, they have little to nothing in common. So this would be a weak comparison. And any conclusion that we wanted to draw between these comparison, comparing these objects would probably, very probably, be a weak analogy. Let's take a look at some fallacies that have been committed and try to determine which fallacy is being committed.
So in our first one, we have Ferguson has directed the university orchestra for eight years. In that time, five members of the orchestra became pregnant. In order to prevent future pregnancies, we should fire Ferguson. So um, take a little bit of time, decide what fallacy you think is being committed. If you maintain that we have false cause occurring here, good. The person who's committing the fallacy is making the assumption that it is Ferguson who is causing the members of the orchestra to become pregnant, which is unlikely in this case. The better explanation is that these five members have their own SOs who you know, they have their own lives together, and that's the explanation for the pregnancy not Ferguson. Now let's look at the example below. Charles Henderson is a tall congressman with brown hair and blue eyes. He supports the upcoming bill on handguns. Congressman Stevens is tall and also has brown hair and blue eyes. In light of the similarities between these two men, it seems clear that Stevens more likely than not uh, supports the handgun bill. So again, take a, a little bit of time to determine what kind of fallacy you think is occurring here. You said weak analogy, good. What's occurring is we have the comparison between um, Charles Henderson and Congressman Stevens, and we find out that they have the same hair color, the same eye color, and that one that um, Charles supports the bill on handguns. And so because of the similarities of uh, hair color and eye color, we can conclude that Stevens is going to um, uh, also support the handgun bill. But hair color and eye color has nothing to do with our political beliefs. So that's a bad inference. It's a weak analogy. Let's look at a couple more examples, a couple more fallacies being committed. The top one says whoever thrusts a knife into another person should be arrested, but surgeons do precisely this when they operate on people. Therefore, surgeons should be arrested. So think to yourself, what fallacy is being committed here? If you maintain that the fallacy being committed is that of accident, good. So that was a fallacy of relevance. And what we have going on is the statement, whoever thrusts a knife into another person should be arrested, is the general rule. But we don't mean for it to be applied to surgeons who thrust knives into people so as to save their lives. So it's a misapplication of the rule and that's the reason why the conclusion does not follow. All right, our next example, despite studying for his biology class with three classmates who are all doing well in the course, Richard has been doing very poorly in the course. Thus, Richard should schedule an appointment with his professor so that he can berate and, criti and criticize her teaching ability. Take a little bit of time and decide what fallacy is being committed. So this is another fallacy of relevance, and it's missing the point, missing the point of the premises. Um, the fact that Richard is studying with people who are all doing well in the course that suggests that it's not the professor's fault that the professor is doing a good job teaching because these people are um, these these other classmates these other students of hers are doing well in the course and richard has even been studying with those people so it suggests that it has something to do with richard or something to do with um, how he's studying when he's in this group etc. 
Let's look at some more examples. Above says, perhaps I lied about my income on my tax return. But your honor, if you find me guilty of tax evasion, I will likely lose my job and many of my friends. My life will be ruined. Surely I'm not guilty. Think about this and decide what fallacy you think is being committed. If you think that the fallacy being committed here is appeal to pity, good, that's correct. The conclusion is, I am not guilty. That's what this person wants the judge to believe or to accept. But of course, the question of whether you're guilty of a crime has nothing to do with whether you, um, whether being convicted of it is going to ruin your life or put you in a pitiful situation. So it is fallacious. All right, our next one. You know, I've begun to think that there's some merit in the Republicans cut in the Republicans tax cut plan. I suggest that you come up with something like it because if we Democrats are going to survive as a party, we've got to show that we are as tough minded as the Republicans since that is what the public wants. So think a little bit about what fallacy you think is occurring here. If you had difficulty with this one, that's not surprising. It's red herring, which is probably the hardest one to pick out. Um, and it's red herring because we start with a topic and then we get off track. We drift from our original topic. And the original topic is whether the Republicans tax cut plan has merit. And instead of going on to talk about why they, this person thinks that's true, what reasons for thinking that that's true, instead we start talking about Democrats surviving as a party and being as tough-minded as the Republicans and the fact that that's what the public wants. Of course, the fact that the public wants those things, if that's true, et cetera, um, or if the Democrats aren't going to survive as a party, that doesn't have anything to do with whether the Republicans tax cut plan in fact has merit. And here's our last example. Sherry argues in favor of reducing the budget of the Defense Department. It appears that Sherry wants no Defense Department at all, but without a Defense Department, we would have no military, and any foreign nation could invade our country at will. Clearly, we can't allow this. Thus, we must reject Sherry's argument. So think about this for a little bit and decide what fallacy you think is being committed. The fallacy being committed here is straw man. So the person uh, informs us that Sherry argues in favor of reducing the budget of the Defense Department, but then is going on to say that what Sherry really wants, what her conclusion really is, is to not have a Defense Department at all. But that's not what Sherry is arguing for. And of course, it it is uh, easy to um, argue against the position that we should have no Defense Department at all because we do have um, foreign enemies and we don't want them to invade our country at will, etc. But that doesn't show, uh, the fact that we clearly don't want that to happen doesn't show that Sherry is wrong um, uh, for being in favor of reducing our budget of the Defense Department. We would need some other arguments to show that she's wrong for that.